Our confessional reading this afternoon is Lord's Day 46. Uh, So as we go through our sermon series on prayer, we're also reading a uh, biblical explanation of uh, the teaching of prayer as we find it in uh, the Heidelberg Catechism. And this afternoon, Lord's Day 46, uh, that number isn't unique or specific in any way, just broken down one for each Sunday of the year. I'll read the question, and then if you want to respond in unison with the answer. Why has Christ commanded us to address God as our Father? To awaken in us at the very beginning of our prayer that childlike reverence and trust toward God which should be basic to our prayer. God has become our Father through Christ and will much less deny us what we ask of him in faith than our fathers would refuse us earthly things. Why is there added in heaven? These words teach us not to think of God's heavenly majesty in an earthly manner and to expect from his almighty power all things we need for body and soul. So, beloved brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, we uh, turn now from a description of a prayer that pleases God uh, to the content of prayer, and we begin the content of prayer with the address. Now, before we look at the address, remember what belongs to a prayer that pleases God, because it can be easy when we start talking about the words that we say in our actual prayer to get overwhelmed and stressed. Thinking that, okay, now we're going to learn about the perfect words that I'm supposed to use and hopefully when I'm asked to pray or when I'm praying, I can use these words. And if I don't, maybe people will think I'm not a believer, not a good Christian or just don't know how to pray. And so as we go into the content of prayer and think about the words, the actual words that we use, remember what we learned a couple weeks ago about what makes a pleasing prayer. A pleasing prayer is a prayer that comes from the heart calling on the one true God. A pleasing prayer is one where we know our sin and misery. We recognize that there was a strange relationship that we had offended God. And so we come with great humility. And a pleasing prayer is also uh, one that that rests in the confidence that God does love us as we look to Jesus Christ and as we are found in Christ. So what we are doing as we learn the content of prayer is as children who love their father, They want to grow. They want to mature. So this afternoon, we're going to talk about the address in prayer. So how do we begin? What do we call God as we pray? I wonder if there's anybody here that's uh, in the early dating stage. Uh, Maybe some young men uh, uh, dating some uh, young uh, women. And... uh, I at least found it awkward to know what to call my now father-in-law. There's that, there's that point in life, and I'm seeing some nods. There's that point in life where you're beginning the dating process, and you wonder, well, what do I call this, this man who's the father of this girl that I'm dating? I can't really call him by his first name. Do I just call him Mr. So-and-so? I can't call him dad because he's not my dad can't call him father. And so what many young men do, or at least what I did, and I assume many young men do, or maybe I'm just the uh, unwise, immature one, is you just don't call him anything. You find ways to just avoid calling him something. And then there comes that moment where uh, you get engaged, and maybe it it comes to the point where where you're married, and then wise father-in-laws clarify what they expect to be called. They'll say, you know, you can call me dad. 
or first name. How do you address someone? As we think about the address of prayer, how do we begin our prayer? For some of us, it comes so naturally, we haven't given much thought to it. We grew up in a Christian home, our parents modeled for us a prayer, and we begin our prayers almost without thought. Why? Because there's just this easy relationship that we've always enjoyed. Well, if that's you, I pray that this afternoon, as we consider the address of prayer, that you'll use this opportunity to think carefully about the way that you begin your prayers. Not to create anxiety, but to find great joy in the way that you can relate to God in prayer. Now, the reality is there are others who come into this not knowing it all. Maybe you have never prayed before and are wondering, well, what does it mean to pray? I don't even know how to begin prayer. What do I say? Do I say, dear God? Do I say, God in heaven? Do I, what, what do I say? What is the address? How do I begin that prayer? Well, I pray that whether the address comes naturally and easy or if for you it's unnatural and you're wondering Uh, How do you begin a prayer uh, that as we look at Scripture, you will see the beauty of what Jesus teaches us in our Father. And what we're going to do is we're going to look first at um, some lessons from the Old Testament. Then we'll see the teaching of Jesus and then finally we'll end with examples from the early church and then wrap it up um, to think about, okay, how do we address uh, God in prayer? Some lessons of the Old Testament. So the Old Testament... uh, is the story of God relating to his people Israel. So humanity had fallen into sin. Uh, All of sin was was covered with the the curse of God uh, because of the rebellion of uh, of humanity. And God had chosen for himself a people. And he said, I will be your God and you will be my people. So there's this relationship. And it's a real relationship. It's a personal relationship where God is not just a distant God in heaven, but God is active and involved in the lives of his people. He uses his almighty power to deliver them from Egypt. Then he works powerfully to protect and to guide them and to provide for them as they're wandering through a desert. And then he prepares for them homes and then brings them into the land of Israel and he provides for them a home. So in the Old Testament, as you see how God relates to his people, you get a picture of a living God, an almighty God, of a personal God who is active and involved in the lives of his people in such an intimate and powerful way, in a way that you might expect a father to act towards his children. And then you look at the prayers in the Old Testament. How did the Old Testament people address God in prayer? Well, if you look at uh, the Old Testament uh, prayers, you see that almost always they began their prayers with Yahweh God or Lord Yahweh. Now, Yahweh is the way that he revealed himself to his people. He said, this is who I am. This is my name. I am who I am. So as you're thinking of all of the things that have been done for you by my powerful hand, how I guided you, provided for you, gave you uh, power to conquer uh, the land of Canaan, it is the name Yahweh I want you to think about. And so God's covenant people would call him by this name. It was the name that they came to know him by. It was the name of a relationship. It would say, Yahweh, our God. Or Yahweh, God in heaven. Or Lord, Master Yahweh. And this is true for how the prophet Moses addresses God. This is true for how King David addresses God. This is even true for how a broken, barren woman, Hannah, who's just stretching out her hands to this living God whom she knows she's part of his covenant people, she addresses him with that Yahweh God, 
Lord God. It's remarkable as you study the Old Testament that the address in prayer was far more distant than we are familiar with today. It's almost like that early dating process where it's Mr. So-and-so and and I don't know who you are, but I know that you're good and you're, you're... Now, here's the truth. They didn't... In the Old Testament, there's no indication of God ever being addressed as Father in prayer. But it's not because they weren't allowed to. In fact, God said, here's how I cared for you in Jeremiah 3 verse 19. I gave you a pleasant land, a heritage most beautiful of all nations, and I thought you would call me my Father And that you would not turn from following me. In other words, he had chosen these people. He had protected them, provided them. And he said, I expected that you would respond as children to a father and that you would call me father. But it doesn't happen in the Old Testament. And why? Well, in the Old Testament, how sin was to be finally resolved was still unclear. It was a promise that God had said, look, your sin does not have to keep you separated from me. Here's a temple, here's an altar, here's sacrifices, and and through these sacrifices, you will be able to approach me. But the reality of how it would finally be resolved was not fulfilled or was not complete yet. Why? Because in the temple you have this great curtain that separates God from his people and he is uh, behind the curtain. And only once a year a representative of the people could go behind the curtain into the most holy place. God is never directly addressed as Father. Why? Because of the reality of unresolved sin. You might today call your father-in-law dad. But if you had cheated on his daughter, he would be angry. And you would very likely not greet him as, hey dad, next time. Even if you repented and reconciled with your wife, you likely would approach that relationship in a whole new way and you would wait until that moment where it was clear that he said, look, you can call me dad. There's nothing between us. You are like a son to me. And so as we look at the Old Testament, we learn a couple lessons from uh, the Old Testament address in prayer. One, that God was powerful, that God was Active and that God used his heavenly power and his heavenly glory on earth for the benefit and well being of his people. That time and again, when the people cried out, Oh Lord God, Yahweh, help us, as a father loves his children, he responded. So, as we look at the Old Testament, that's the first thing that we see God's almighty power at work for his people, but you also see the reality of this strained, broken relationship that needed to be resolved. And that's a story, not just of the Israelites, but that's also part of your story and my story. Because all of us, apart from Jesus Christ, have the reality of that strained relationship. And so as we think of how to address God as Father, as we think of a prayer that is pleasing to God, we must remember that story of sin and separation of former rebellion that needed to be resolved. 
So while we look at the teaching of Jesus on how we are to begin our prayer, our address is different than in the Old Testament, but it does not mean we can ignore the reality of their story because their story of sin and rebellion is our story. But then, as we heard this morning, God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, born in Bethlehem, began his ministry in Galilee, called various disciples to himself, and these disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Why? Because they saw Jesus praying. Praying throughout his life. And these disciples said, we want to know. Teach us how to pray. And what does he say? This is how you pray. When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven. It is quite remarkable and a powerful contrast with the way that all the Old Testament people of God prayed. Jesus says, here's how I want you to pray. Pray, Our Father. And we get a little bit of a sense that when Jesus says our Father, it's not some distant reality about uh, a God who is in heaven uh, because elsewhere uh, Jesus uses the language of Abba, Father. And in our reading from Romans chapter 8, um, we read there that the Spirit helps us to call Abba, Father. And Abba is an Aramaic term that translates as Father. But it's a a term of familial intimacy and childlike trust. Like a, fa- like a child who might feel safe wrapped up in his father's arms. So the word Abba has this relationship of powerful intimacy and trust where a child says, I can put my life, I can put my cares, I can put my worries uh, completely into uh, this person's arms and I can know he'll love me and care for me and provide for me and so Abba has that sense of familial intimacy and childlike trust but it's also a word of respect and obedience Abba in Aramaic um, history it's not a word that would be used if there's a strange relationship No, Abba means, Father, I love you. I entrust myself into your care and I will follow you and obey you. Only an obedient child could use that word. And not just obedient children. Adults would use Abba as well. So it's not, in modern English, there's this word, Daddy. It's not, it doesn't have the same sense as that English word, daddy. It's far deeper, far richer, far more meaningful, and far more submissive. Abba, father. And the father there is just the Greek, and it's uh, pater, which is here translated into English, father. So what does Jesus teach his disciples? He says, the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, the God who revealed himself to the people of Israel as the great I am, as Yahweh. The God who provided for them, protected them, and also disciplined them. Here's how I want you to address him. Our Father. This is how Jesus addressed God. If you look at the prayers of Jesus Christ, he addressed God as Father. And why? Because he is the eternal Son of God. This is uh, the reality of the Trinity that the Bible uh, teaches us, uh, that God is uh, one being, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, yet one God. 
And here the eternal Son of God, as he took on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and lives and walks in this world and then also prayed in ancient Palestine, he prayed, Father, I thank you, Father, Abba, Father. We read just a little bit of the uh, high priestly prayer in John 17 uh, where Jesus begins with Father And then he repeats that term, Father, in his prayer five times. Twice in uh, those five instances, he adds an adjective. Once in verse 11, John 17, verse 11, he calls him Holy Father. And that's in the context of uh, Jesus praying for uh, his disciples in the world. And he recognizes uh, in uh, that uh, prayer, Holy Father, that God is separate from the world. He's different. He's not part of uh, this earthly world of sin and sorrow. He's a Holy Father, perfect in every way. And then the other adjective he uses in verse 25 is Righteous Father. Righteous Father there in the context of his plan of redemption. That when God promises something, he fulfills it. Jesus is the perfect Son of God, and God in heaven, God the Father, at his baptism, looked down on Jesus Christ and says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And now when Jesus teaches his disciples, he teaches uh, the followers of Jesus Christ, he tells them, and to them and to you and to me, he says, you too call him Father. He's my Father And he's your father. He's our father. Jesus is teaching us that you, by faith in Jesus Christ, have the exact same relationship with the almighty heavenly God as he does. That as Jesus Christ is the Son of God, so you are children of God. With all of the rights and privileges and and responsibilities that are associated with that familial connection. Now this does mean that to address God as our Father is not for everyone but only for those who have placed their trust in Jesus Christ. When Jesus is teaching the Lord's Prayer, he's doing so in response to a question from his disciples. And Paul in Romans chapter 8 makes clear that we cry, Abba, Father. We have this childlike trust and this confidence uh, that we can speak to him in this very powerfully in this very powerful, intimate way, we do that through a powerful work of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. Why? Because we've been adopted into God's family by faith in Jesus Christ through a work of the Spirit that lives within us. You can say, Abba, Father, not because you have finally been the perfect child today. Or you didn't make any mistakes and as you come to Him... You can say, Abba, Father, because there's nothing strained. Not because you've been the perfect child, but because Jesus Christ was the perfect Son of God who died on the cross and paid for your sins. And by faith in Him, His perfection, His righteousness is accredited to your account. Where God sees you and God sees me as the perfect Son, Jesus. And so to address God as our Father means that you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ. That you've been adopted into the family of God through the powerful work of Jesus Christ and that the Holy Spirit has been poured into your heart. It's that Holy Spirit that enables us to cry with all of the genuineness of heart, Abba, Father. 
Jesus makes this clear when he says, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. In other words, Jesus Christ is saying that if you deny Jesus Christ, don't think that the Father will say, this is my child. Christ will say, no, he's not. He's not my brother. He's not my sister. So as we go through this teaching of the address of prayer, how do you begin your prayer? To be able to say our Father means you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ. If you don't know or don't believe in Jesus Christ, acknowledge your sins. Cry out to Jesus Christ. And we'll look at that in the final uh, point. Cry out to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, save me. Save me. And through faith, then you receive the Holy Spirit. As we come to the final point and look at, uh, prepare to look at the examples from the early uh, church, this language of Abba, Father, the catechism phrases it so powerfully. It says, as we begin our prayers with this, with this address, it awakens in us from the very beginning a childlike reverence and trust toward God that should be basic to our prayers. And that word awaken, it's, it, it's a beautiful word because it calls us to attention. It says, look, as you're preparing to pray and then as you begin your prayer, you can say, our Father in heaven, and let the reality, the full reality, and the beauty of those words sink in so that as you pray, you do so as a child completely entrusting your life, your work, cares, your worries into the hands of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, uh, into the hands of God the Father through Jesus Christ. And Jesus invites us to imagine an earthly father, and he says, here's the reality In Luke 11, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? In other words, as you begin with those words, recognize this is a glorious Heavenly Father who is far more powerful and far more good than any earthly father we've ever had. Because he's not like an earthly father. Earthly fathers let their kids down a lot. I know, because I do. Earthly fathers are limited on time. Our heavenly father always has time. Earthly fathers are limited in power. Our Heavenly Father is almighty. Earthly fathers are limited in wisdom. Our Heavenly Father always knows what we need. Earthly fathers are sinful and lazy and often selfish. Our Heavenly Father does not hold back. Earthly fathers are limited in where they can be can't be in two places at once. Heavenly Father is everywhere present. So as we begin those, with those words, our Father, we add, who art in heaven. Why? Because as the catechism says, these words teach us not to think of God's heavenly majesty in an earthly manner. There's a depth, there's a glory, and there's a beauty, and there's a richness to the reality of who God is and what it means that this living God who created everything with the power of his word is, for the sake of Jesus Christ, my God and my Father. And so what do you see in the early church as uh, believers begin to see the glory of God's gift in Jesus Christ and enjoy this new relationship with God the Father through the Holy Spirit, they begin uh, to overwhelmingly address God as Father. Paul, whenever he's writing his letters, he often begins his letters with greetings. 
to you from our Father. Paul, when he writes in Ephesians 3, verse 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Colossians 1, verse 3, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And so as we think about how we begin our prayers, the teaching of Jesus should take primacy. Our Father. Let the richness of those words guide you as you begin your prayers. One theologian calculated that 95% of the passages in the New Testament referring to prayer and worship focus on the Father. Well, what about prayer addressed to Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit? The remaining 5%, as this theologian um, looked at it, refer or focus on Jesus Christ. As we look at those passages, we see that unbelievers are encouraged to call out to Jesus Christ. Christ made this clear. There is no access to the Father except through me. So if you want to be able to come to God in prayer, you must do so through Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, or if you have not been saved by Jesus Christ, then call out to Jesus Christ. Acts 2 verse 21, It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 22, verse 16, why do you wait? Rise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on his name. That is the name of Jesus. There is no other way. And then uh, disciple of Jesus Christ, Stephen, when he died, he prayed to the Lord Jesus to receive his spirit. He prayed to the Lord Jesus for the salvation of those who murdered him. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Paul, when he's praying for deliverance from the thorn in the flesh, he pleads with Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior. Paul, when he tells Timothy to flee youthful passions and to pursue righteousness, says, do so along with those who call on the Lord. So when you think about prayer and the address of prayer in New Testament example, uh, we see that Jesus Christ is often addressed when there's great need for deliverance or salvation. And then in the New Testament, there's no examples of praying to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is most often described as with us, helping us to pray. We're told to pray in Ephesians 6 verse 18 and Jude 20 in the Spirit, in the reality of what the Spirit brings to us by faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans 8 verse 26 and 27, it's the Spirit who helps us call out Abba, Father. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit of God that confirms to us the reality of our relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. So there's no scriptural examples of praying to the Holy Spirit, which may make you wonder, well, can we pray to the Holy Spirit? Well, the Bible doesn't say not to. There's one passage in the Old Testament where God uh, tells Ezekiel uh, to prophesy, to call on the Spirit of God to bring new life. But God makes clear when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. In our Nicene Creed, we say we believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And so the normal way as we long to see the Spirit working in our life is to address God the Father and the Son who have poured out the Holy Spirit. Can we pray to the Holy Spirit? 
would be wrong for me to say from this pulpit that we may not do so. There are, there's a rich tradition in our early church fathers uh, that will, in, in, in some small specific ways, address the Holy Spirit in prayer. But if you take the teaching of the New Testament, the normal way of understanding prayer is that we address our prayer to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ by the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. God makes it clear in Scripture our relationship with Him. A young man might struggle and wonder, well, what do I call my hopefully future father-in-law or now my father-in-law? But God makes it clear. Jesus, our eldest brother, guides us in it. He teaches us. He says, come, you're my brothers and sisters. Let's go to God in prayer. He's not a distant God. You don't have to address it in an impersonal way. But he's our father. And so as we pray, come to him and say, our father in heaven. That's a blessing. It's a blessing. And may it awaken in us whenever we pray that childlike reverence and trust, knowing that He can and will give us all things we need for body and soul. Amen.